welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down my knees and pray. You need to stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. <clears throat> I know you're all thinking I need a lot of help, <laughs> but so do you. I need more help getting up than anything. Now that I'm down, I need some energy. Shark's tongue. <laughs> Don't bring me any, please. No, I'm just playing with you. Father, we just love to have the joy of the Lord as our strength tonight as we boldly come before the throne of grace in the name of Jesus, making our petitions known to you. We haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or woman, young man, old man, tall man, short man, white man, black man, brown man. We haven't come into the house of God to hear from anyone except the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We are a grateful people. Lord, we would ask that you bless us. Yes, of course, Lord. But we want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. The Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia. We thank you, Father, for Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. And no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, uh uh yours. That's what this is all about. And God, we give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. <laughs> Take your Bible, go with me to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I'm not worried about going to Hebrews in the 5th chapter. You know where that's at. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, we won't be there for a number of years, so we can go to the scripture there. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, on weekends we go line upon line, precept upon precept. For years we've been in five verses, uh, excuse me, five chapters. And um, so it'll be a long time. We're in no hurry around this place. We teach line upon line, precept upon precept, the Word of God. But tonight's a little bit different. We're going to step away from that. We're going to go to some scripture. The title of the message is Patiently Waiting on the Lord. It's a quality that I hate. And I find that most people hate it also. Just waiting on God. Something boring about that. Can't we just kind of like speed this up? I mean, I'm broke now. I could do something if you just give me the money now, not down the road. I don't know if I need it down the road, but I do know I need it now. Could I have it right now? Is anybody ever in a hurry besides me? I find in the scripture that God talks an awful lot about this word called patience. It's an amazing word. And when you add it to your Christian vocabulary, listen to this, and then add it as a biblical principle in your heart, it changes your life dramatically. Patience is a word that most people don't want any part of. In fact, foolish people pray to God, say something like this, well, God, you know, Give me patience. Never pray to God about giving you patience. He'll just hold everything off until you finally have patience. So the object is, is to pretend at least that you do have patience. Of course, God knows inside of your heart whether you do or don't, but when you have patience, something dramatically takes place. There's more than just the development of your heart that takes place with the application of patience in your life. There isn't anybody in here that hasn't tried something, done something, been believing God for something. And it just didn't come the way you thought it ought to come. It didn't happen as fast as you would like to have had it happen. It was just something you often said to God, God, it's okay, but I don't understand why. 
Why didn't it happen? Why didn't it come about? Why did it take so long? And then if it ever, and then maybe it hasn't even come to pass yet. I, I was talking with my daughter not too long ago. She was a, um, a daughter that I, of course, had a, when she was born. She, she was 20-some years old before she came to live with us. She had lived with her mother for 20-some-odd years in Las Vegas and got caught up in all of the trash of Las Vegas. She was talking about her boys and her life, and she made a statement. She said, I just don't understand why things take so long. I said, if there's anybody ought to know the answer to that, it ought to be you. I waited over 20 years for answered prayers with you. I'm grateful that God answered the prayers when he did and how he did. If he had answered them earlier, they may not have come out the way that they came out. Which is an interesting thought, isn't it? Let me take you, if I may, into some scripture. And I want to just share them with you tonight because may I promise you this? You're going to have to. I'm going to say it again one more time. You're going to have to. One more time. You're going to have to live your life with an attitude of patience with God because God is not in a hurry for anything. And I don't know why he isn't in a hurry. I guess he's saying something to all of us that time is not going to run him. He runs time. And quite frankly, he doesn't need anything we have to offer. He lets us offer. Are you following me? And there's this wonderful verse in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 36. It says it like this. It says, you have need of endurance. In the old King James, I'll pop that up for you right now because it says the same thing, but it says it differently. You have need of patience. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Sometimes we read that, we hear it. But it really hasn't settled down on the inside of us because we face situations every day of our life that don't seem to be changing, don't seem to come to the past. Our prayers don't seem to be answered, you know. Our finances never seem to change. Even the situations of our life just never really changes. I have a little service on Sabbath morning. I'm dedicated to that Sabbath morning service. Well, I don't know how many years. Would you guess that we've had a Sabbath service maybe 12, 13 years? It just doesn't grow. Many times people have come to me and said, why don't you just give it up? Because I'm just not giving up. God's not in any hurry. It's going to be one of the greatest, most powerful services of the week. And I'm just here to tell you, it hasn't started yet. Timing isn't taking place yet. Things haven't happened yet. The promise comes along and says, you have need of something. And he comes along and he doesn't just say endurance. Endurance means you can push through and keep pushing through and keep pushing through. The word patience means sitting back waiting. So he says you have need of patience that after you have done the will, after you have done the will of God. I don't know about you, after I've done the will of God, I expect results. Am I the only one in here after I do the will of God? I say, hey, I've done it. I've walked in love or I've walked in faith. I've done it. It's time now. You know, and it still doesn't happen. Has anybody ever been there besides me? He says, after you've done the will of God, I'm expecting some results. After time, it doesn't. He says, you might receive the promise. So after I've done the will of God, tells me I have to do something first with patience. I have to do the will of God. Then I have to not only do the will of God, I've got to be patient until the results come, so promise. So it's a real insight in where we're all going and what this is really all about. Interesting verse. I'm taking another little verse that's kind of fun, Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 7, chapter, verse number 8, just popped up on the overhead. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. Wait a minute. I don't know if you realize what he just said. The end of a thing is better than the beginning of a thing. So that means if I let something play out to the end, it will be better than the beginning. But if I don't let something play out to the end, then it's not as good as the beginning. And he says, the, listen to this, 
The patient spirit is better than the proud spirit. Someone says, well, what does that mean? The proud spirit's about itself. The patient spirit's about God. When your spirit trusts the Lord in a spirit of patience for the results that you haven't seen but you know you want that are coming someday when you don't know when it's going to happen, then his promise to you is the end is better than the beginning. And he also says it's a whole lot better than to have an egotistical spirit about yourself, pride. It's better for you to have a spirit of patience because then it's about God doing the work, his timing, his will, his place. You stop and you think about it for your lives and my life. You, know, you stop and talk about like Joseph, for an example. What a weird character he is in the Bible. I mean, he gets this dream, right? He tells his brothers, tells his father. And his brothers get mad at him, beat him up, throw him down a hole, drag him out, sell him off to a caravan that's going to Egypt. He's in slavery for years, and then he has to stand righteous, all the pressure's on him. Now listen to this. Then he gets thrown into prison, and then he eventually goes from prison to the palace, and runs and governs all of Egypt only years later to make a statement, it was for God's good that this was to pay. The end is better than the beginning. And you stop and you think about, well, what did the guy do between the time he heard from God on the, you know, the dream that God gave him and the time that it came to pass? I would have given up, wouldn't you? I would have said, man, that must have been the pizza I ate that night and forget it, I... I don't know where that dream come from, you know, too much salami or something. And, 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 and you know, you find yourself in a place of, uh, uh, you know, stop thinking about a guy like that. He had to be incredibly patient because it was probably anywhere from 15 to 20 years before he became empowered. In a prison, the furthest place from ever achieving and accomplishing what he thought he should be achieving and accomplishing. That's like crazy, my friends. And yet here he is. And there's nobody to talk to him. There's no pe preachers. He doesn't go to church on Sunday. He doesn't get to read his Bible about himself or somebody like him. He just has to be patient from the beginning to have better results to the end. How about David? I mean, David's minding his own business on the hills of Judea singing to sheep. His whole, his whole day is bothered by whether they go poop or don't go poop. I mean, that's like no big deal. You know, drink a little water, eat some grass. Wow, how cool is this job? You know, and all of a sudden they call him in, they anoint him king, and then he's facing a giant. Like, what's that all about? And, and, and you're fa he's facing this giant. He's going to be king, and then he's facing the giants after that. And then he finally, somewhere down the line, as he grows up, maybe 15 years later, he had to exercise some patience. He had nobody telling him what to do and how to do it. He had nobody coming along. He didn't have a church service to go to and raise his hands and sing songs and hear messages about faith. He just had to be patient in the midst of all of that. I mean, you stop thinking about Paul, for an example. How nutty is that? God gives him the dispensation of grace. That's the time period of grace. Nobody else had it but Paul. And for 14 years, he stays out of Jerusalem. He's in the wilderness for 14 years. And then when he goes to Jerusalem, here you find everybody in Jerusalem that should be his brothers supporting him. Man, they're taking vows to kill him. Nobody's there. James, Peter, John, you don't see anybody helping Paul. They can hardly wait for him to be thrown into jail. He's in jail for two years. You've got to be kidding me. What a lot. And then he gets off of that, gets shipwrecked, snake bit. Then he gets, oh my goodness, before he even gets to the place in Rome where they're going to kill him eventually. This is like a miserable thing. He's got to be patient in order for things to happen in his life. And here we come along. Let's be honest with each other. We try Christianity, we give our heart to the Lord, we sing songs, we learn stuff, and when things don't happen as fast as they want them, we think they ought to happen. We give up, we quit, we grumble, we complain, we call God out. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. And it ought not to be. In fact, Jesus makes a statement in Luke 20, 
First chapter, verse 19, pop it up. I think it's 21, 19. Jesus makes this statement. By your patience, possess your souls. <coughs> By your patience, possess your, you know what that means? In other words, if you don't have patience, you'll never have control of your thinking. It'll just take you everywhere. You'll be down, discouraged, frustrated. You'll never have it. The end will never be better than the beginning. Is anybody listening? Patience is a powerful word. So let me just share with you three quick principles with you, if I may. I call them disciplines. Disciplines means this. It's something you do in order to perfect what it is you're doing. It's called disciplines. Three disciplines to patience. First one is my favorite. They're all good, but this is my favorite one. Three disciplines to patience. Make patience part of your plan. In other words, when you plan to do something, do you ever work in the word patience? No, no, you don't, and you know that. You say, I'm going to go to this and this city, and I'm going to do this and this business, and I'm going to do that. And then you remember the verse out of James that said, well, if God tells us we should do that, then that's what we should do. Okay, so then you go back to God, you pray about it with God. But did you know something that God wants to work out the plan? He doesn't want to just give you the results. He wants to give you the results his way. And in order for his way results to come, he's going to have to manipulate, work on, change, uh, put people in the right place, take the right timing. He's got a, he's got a, it's like a big chessboard called earth. And he's playing the game, getting you to right where you need to be. If my daughter had come to me when she was 15 years old, it would have never worked. She would have never gone through what she went through. She would have never been the Christian she is today. If she had come, which I wanted her more than anything, come and live with us. I even went to court at 12 years old and fought for her because I knew she was in an ungodly home. And man, the courts didn't care a bit in those days. And Deborah and I fought for her. Now she's, you know, pushing 40 years old or something, but it's, but at that time, if she had come when she was 10 years old and, or 12 years old, I, I would have been so thrilled it would have been an answer to prayer, but it wouldn't have been the complete answer. You gotta hear this. You gotta give time for God to complete the desire of your heart. And it takes patience to give God the time to fulfill the plan that God has for your life. Are you following me? In other words, my Sabbath servant hasn't come to pass like I've envisioned it to come to pass, but can I tell you something? Somehow God is moving this and moving that, making this happen and making that happen, and it may take another 10 years or 12 years, but it's going to happen and it's going to come to pass because God is moving heaven and earth, and sometimes that takes time, and I've got to trust that God's in my plan more than my result because the results I need are the perfect plan of God. Oh, come on, somebody. Now, watch this. The Bible makes it very clear in James, the first chapter, verse number four. It says, but let your patience have her perfect work. James 1, 4. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete. In other words, if it doesn't have its perfect work, you're not going to get perfect and complete. Lacking, what's that word? Nothing. Wait a minute, lacking what? Nothing. Wait a minute, lacking what? Nothing. Wait a minute, if you don't let patience work its way out and work all the details of the blessings that you're wanting from God, then it might be that you get what you think is the blessings of God, but it'll be lacking something and won't be perfect and complete. So built into the formula of our life has got to be the plan that, okay, God, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how it's going to work. And I'm going to be patient no matter how long it takes until it comes to pass. Because I know you're, from this moment on, when I say amen, you're working on it for me to be perfect and wanting nothing. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. <clears throat> you know it's true. We're talking about three disciplines of patience. Second one, patience. And I, I should have used the word use. I, 
I should have, you know where it says, my, the second title here, I, I, I meant to use the word use, patience in a time of pressure. So let's put up patience in a time of pressure, uh, and I'll explain what that means. But use patience, is, I wanted to use the word U-S-E. You, use patience in a time of pressure. When there is pressure on you, you must understand that's the process you go through in order to get to the blessings. It is not an uncommon thing to have pressure on you. It happens to everybody in Scripture. God never comes along and says, well, you know, you're immune to pressure. Uh, you'll never have a problem again. Well, you won't have a problem again as long as you keep casting your cares on he that careth. But we're learning how to do that. And in a time of pressure, I've got to realize that's a time for me to exercise great patience. And that should be the bell that goes off. That's the whistle in my heart. That's the umpire in my life that says, wait a minute, stop, Jim. You're under pressure for something. Now it's time. It's time for you to exercise patience under this pressure. Have you ever been under pressure where you said, I, 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 I got to have it by Friday? I just got to have it by Friday. You ever notice Friday comes and goes? And then you say, I got to have it by Monday. And then Monday comes and goes, you got to have it by Wednesday. I got to have it by Wednesday. I mean, you, you need to understand that during this time of pressure, which is very common, is a, is a time that I apply something very unusual. I, I apply patience. God is in control. There's this great little verse in Scripture uh, found in 2 Thessalonians. Go there with me as Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. And as he writes to the church at Thessalonica, he writes something that just caught my eye, if you will, in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verse number 3, and verse number 4, and verse number 5. It says, And we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abound towards each other. Verse number four. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. What for? For your patience and faith. Isn't it interesting how he said, patience, then faith. We talk so much about faith, but real faith has got to have patience working in order to hold your faith place. Your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that you endured. He goes on and says, man, you really endured it. In times of pressure, you and I have got to be wise enough to walk in two areas. One, patience, the second, faith. And you'll never have faith if there's no patience that goes with it. Because it's without it, you just get run off. We're talking about disciplines to patience. Number three, I like this. Patience, use patience in the face of time. Ever been in a hurry? Ever said to yourself, this has got to happen now? I, I don't know. It happens more and more to me. Maybe it's because of my age. You know, this year, I'm 68 years old. This year, I see my life changing more than I've ever seen it change. I'm not able to do the things I used to do. In my 50s, I loved snow skiing. In my er late 50s, I loved sailing and early 60s. But now I find myself in my latter part of the 60s completely different. Time plays 
the biggest role in my life than ever before. Because I find myself feeling, and it's not true, but I find myself feeling that I'm running out of time and whatever it is that I've got to accomplish, I've got to accomplish now. And I want it now, today, on time, quick and fast. And I was talking to God about it. And he said, you've always been that way. <laughs> Even when you were 20, you were very impatient. Wanting it now. Your favorite restaurant was Taco Bell when you drove in and got it for 20 cents off if it was over 30 seconds before you got it all. In the face of time, you and I have got to use patience. God is no hurry whatsoever. And if God can bring something to pass at age 20, God can bring something to pass at age 40, and I can enjoy it as much at age 40. And then I can enjoy it as much at age 60 or 70 or 80 because the enjoyment doesn't come from the thing. The enjoyment comes from the presence of God. Is anybody listening? So I find myself oftentimes, I don't know, it's just part of the nature on the inside of me. I want it, and I want it now. In fact, poor Deborah, I think I drive her nuts. She always says to me, do you want me to make you a sandwich or something? I have to tell you, she's not here, so I'll just tell you the truth. She is the best sandwich maker in the whole world. No doubt about it, but she takes her time. It's like 40 minutes later, I get this sandwich. Man, girl, just get two pieces of bread and slap some crappy cheese on there, throw a gob of mayonnaise on it, throw some mustard on it, and give it to the man. You know, it's like 40 minutes later. She's great at making it, but I got to have it now. You know what I'm talking about. I read this verse in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number 13, speaking of Abraham. Don't you just love Abraham? God speaks to him, you're going to have a son. He gets all excited, man. Can you imagine how thrilled he was? His name is going to be called Isaac. I'm 90 years old. Wow, this is going to be great. He's 91 years old. Where's Isaac? In fact, where's Sarah? <laughs> 92 years old. Where's Sarah again? It's that time of year. It used to be every day. But when you're 100, it's once a year. You know what I'm talking about if you're my age. <laughs> God, only at The Rock do we talk about such things, you know what I mean? Any other church would throw me out. So here's Abraham, he's going to have this baby, and he's finally 100 years old. Can I tell you something? Did he enjoy it as much as any child? Man, he was with that boy all the time, and had a relationship with him that was dynamic. He went hiking with him up the top of the mountain. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> Carrying a bundle of wood and an ax. I mean, the guy's camping with his kid. He didn't tell his kid he was the fire. So Abraham's this amazing man of, if you really want to know faith, yes, but phenomenal patience. And he says this in verse 13 of the sixth chapter. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by any greater, he swore by himself. That in itself I could preach to you a month on. Just that, what I just said. It's amazing saying, surely blessings I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so as, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. After he had patiently endured, we face things and we want them now. We're in financial crisis now. We need health now. We need success in our life now. 
We need everything now. It doesn't make sense to us why God doesn't meet our needs now. But what if God's got a plan that the end is going to be a whole lot better than the beginning? And you and I have got to live a life of patience, knowing assuredly. Great missionary to India lost all of his, spent his entire life interpreting the Bible, translating the Bible into an Indian dialect just to have it at the end of his life burn up in a fire and lost all of it. You say, what's that all about? Would you be mad at God? I would be. He just started all over, kept on going. Why? Because this is not about us. It's about him. If it's about us, then it's about pride. But if it's about him, then it's about patience in one who knows how to take care of tomorrow. If God spoke to you tonight, give the Lord a great big praise. You do that? I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave, so let's just take a moment. Everybody, just be real still. Nobody get up and leave. Lots of you have already gotten up and left already, but just give me a few moments, and then we'll let you go in just a few moments. Nothing could be worse than you coming into the house of God. We have a great time listening to the Word, singing songs, doing all the mute. Oh, man, that was so cool. But guess what? Then you die and go to hell? Like, what's that all about? That is like crazy. I don't want you to die and go to hell. I want you to go to heaven and so do you and you know you, know you need to. You know you want to. So listen to me. For a moment, just listen to me. You don't get to go to heaven because you're a nice person. No, no, you don't get to go to heaven because you're good. No, no, you don't get to go to heaven because you say you love God. Come on, listen to me. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you were a Christian when you were a kid. You know, took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. Nowhere, it's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. You know, the funny thing about it is Jesus makes this statement. Watch what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. No man goes to the Father except by me. Now, he's either crazy making that statement or he is really the Son of God. And for thousands of years, everything he said has proved itself to come to pass. For thousands, not just a few times, for thousands and thousands of years, the prophecies are about him that have all come to pass. Every act on that cross, every act in that tomb, everything that took place, raised from the dead on the third day, the whole thing, everything was prophesied and proved himself to be the son of God. No other human being, God on earth, has ever affected mankind like Jesus Christ. And he said, there's no way you can get to heaven except his way. And he makes the statement and he proves it. And he tells us exactly in the scripture what's his way. He tells us. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. No. You got to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven. He says these words, you must be born again. John 3rd chapter. Now when I use the words born again, most people turn off in American churches immediately. You know why? Because Hollywood has portrayed born again people like idiots and radicals and fanaticals and goofballs and nobody wants to be a goofball. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Born again means something. Here's what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, this is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. 
All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. All or nothing. Last book in the Bible. Book of Revelation. You've heard of it. Jesus is speaking in the book of Revelation. And he says, I'm coming again. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, uh-uh, man, you're in trouble. I'm going to vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it. They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow. Now let me define for you what lukewarm is so we're on the same page. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, you know, you're not against God. No, no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. How about this, lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And by the way, until you make him everything, he will never be something. So tonight, somebody needs to love you enough respect you enough and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. In order for you to get to heaven, you must be born again, which means you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Can I say it like this to you? Listen to this. I said give because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. Give because he's not a manipulator to make you do this. Hit you in the head with a two by four until you finally give in. He could do that if he needed to, but he doesn't. He gave you the free will choice to give God all of your heart. A free will choice to give God all of your life. Stop thinking about it. You're going to tell me God who created the heavens and the earth couldn't create a robot that looks just like you? Billions of them if he wanted. All of them which could worship him. That's not what this is about. He gave you a free will spirit, a free will choice. It's your call to whether or not you'll give God your heart and give God your life. And here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've sung, we've had a great time. You were great listening to the word of God. And now tonight is your divine appointment with God to give God all of your heart, to give God all of your life. Tonight is your night of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang, with that sound. Bang, your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. And as your hand goes up, you're making a statement. You're saying, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. Because I already know you know who he is. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year. You know who Jesus is in your head, but that doesn't make you a Christian. It's not about what you've done with your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. And as your hand goes up, I'll see your hand go up and you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down. It couldn't get any simpler than that. But tonight is your divine appointment. You say, Pastor Jim, you want me to raise my hand? You're going to clap and pop your hands together, and you want me to raise my hand? I'll feel funny. I'll be embarrassed. People behind me will see me. People that I came with will see me. I'll feel weird. Yep, you will. You'll feel embarrassed. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever, ever and ever and ever and ever. Today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, get ready to pop your hand up. Get ready to give him all of your heart and all of your life. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure tonight is your night. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham. Maybe even prayed at a harvest crusade. But did you follow up your prayer with all of your heart and life? Or was it just a little magical formula you're hoping that God hears it'll get you into heaven and you call to prayer? Listen, God watches your life that follows your heart to see whether or not your prayer is real. Tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? Don't let anything stop you. 
I'm counting to three, pop my hands together all across this auditorium. Here it is. In the family rooms, I'm speaking to you. In the foyer by television, I'm speaking to you. In this family room, it's full too. I'm speaking to you all across this auditorium. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Back over here. There's six. Back over here. There's seven. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Back over here. There's eight. There's nine. There's 10. There's 11. How many, Martin? 11, 12, 13, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else, real quick? Anybody else? There's another one, 14, 15, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Mike in the foyer, anybody back there? Thank you. Four, there's 15, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else, real quick? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Thank you, Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. All 15 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. If you raise your hand, you're in the family rooms. Ushers, let's help them. Out of the family rooms. Get up here quick. Bring your kids. It's okay. But we want you to hurry to do this. Remember, we're talking about patience, but now use patience tomorrow. Today, we're in a hurry. So uh, we want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Come on, let's nobody leave. Let's welcome them as they come. If you raise your hand, if you know you should have, get up here right now. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I you guys have come. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff to take home and read about what to do next. Simple, simple, simple. Now that you're a Christian, don't you want to know what God wants from you? Well, that's what will tell you what to do. And then just follow that. And the third, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Those are friends. We give away friends around here. Someone to help you. Someone to pray with you. Someone to encourage you. Meet you at church. Buy you some coffee, tea, nachos. Go over some scripture with you. We don't want you to go back and fall through the cracks doing all the same stuff you used to do. We want you to go on and be happy, filled, strong, healthy with Christ. We want to help you get strong with the Lord. So let us help you do that. Give us a year to do that, and you'll be blessed out of your socks. Am I right, guys? It's just wonderful. So come on. You can do this. So you're going you're gonna to give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. Give it to him. All of your heart, all of your life. Make that commitment. Make a left turn, if you would. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.